Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. If you uh, do not have a Bible, I want to invite you to uh, get a pew Bible out of the seat in front of you, if you would. And you will find our text on page 1056. I'll just give you a few moments to get there before we begin. Still hear some pages turning. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to collect things. I collect things that I'm thinking that I might reuse those things in the future for other future projects around the house. Just for example, I might tear down a fence. I will keep the post in the fence because, you know, I might need to use that fence again later and place it someplace else. My wife calls this junk collecting. I call it resourcefulness. If I want to build something, I do not want to go and have to uh, spend money on something else if I have exactly what I need in front of me. To me, this seems smart. To others, it might seem like a time, a waste of time and a waste of space. You're collecting junk and placing it places, and your neighbors don't like you for it. So although I get a little older, I've come to realize that sometimes getting exactly what I need is best instead of collecting junk. Because if I go to put that fence someplace else, well, when I wiggle the fence post out of the ground in the first place, now they're crooked. And my project doesn't turn out quite as I had hoped or as I'd planned. It would probably just be best to throw the junk out and build from something better. I want us to see this morning that God has built something when it comes to the church, to the local church, us as a corporate body of people. He did not go to the junk pile to build us. He had choice materials that he used. He's very intentional about what he chose. And so he was very intentional also about why he chose it. So this morning in our text, the writer is Peter. And Peter wants us as readers and as believers, as we sit and we read this, he wants us to understand that God is intentional and that he's building this spiritual house that you and I are a part of. Others might disagree about how God builds it. Others might disagree with the materials that he chose to build it with. They might even reject his materials, as we'll see in some of our texts today. The people of God are the materials in God's spiritual house, and it's for a purpose. And it was built upon a chief cornerstone, a precious chief cornerstone for a purpose. And so the main idea in our passage this week, if you are taking notes, this is the main takeaway for our text this morning. We are a spiritual house built upon a lively stone, which is Christ, so that we would glorify God. That's why we are placed here. And we'll see three points in our text that will support that statement this morning. The first is found in verses 4 through 5, and it is this. We are a living spiritual house, and we are serving God sacrificially. Our second point, our spiritual house is built upon a precious stone, precious material, not from the junk pile. Verses 6 through 8. We are chosen to show forth the praises of God, verses 9 through 10. The reason why we're here. The reason why we're placed in this body is for that. And so for this reason, this morning's message is titled, The Spiritual House and the Chosen People. So why? Why is this message important to us as believers? Well, the reason is because we can often get caught up in life and find church attendance monotonous. The songs, if we're not careful, can be monotonous. We sing them regularly, so you might lose the meaning of them. So this is to help you stay encouraged. It's to help you understand that you're singing for a purpose, and you'll see it in our text today. And so let's read the text, and we'll get into our first point. Join me in verses 4 through 10. It says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also, it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded." Unto you, therefore, which believeth, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. 
and the stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumbleth at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So let's begin with our first point as we move through our text. I'll just review it again real quickly. We are, living a, we are a living spiritual house serving God sacrificially. So in these opening verses, verses 4 through 5, Peter is describing God building a spiritual temple and using lively stones in this temple, in this structure, this spiritual structure. These lively stones have come to the one chief and living stone which is our Savior, Jesus Christ. What Peter is doing, he's trying to help us understand that as Israel had a temple in the Old Testament that was built by God, we as Christians also have a temple as Israel did. But our house is uniqueer. It is more unique. It is different. It isn't physical. It is a spiritual house. And so to help us understand this, Peter uses some very descriptive language that would apply to the Old Testament temple and some of the workers and some of the buildings. And so we as, a Christ, as Christians have to understand that he is trying to apply this language to us that we might already be familiar with to, to, to describe this spiritual house that he's, he's building for us. So, and I want us to understand that the Bible uses all kinds of descriptive language about the coming Messiah being a stone. So I'm not going to labor that point. I'm just going to go ahead and get into our text, understanding that you already know that because we've seen that through part of our Exodus series. So what I want us to focus on instead as we move forward in this verse four is the first thing is this. Christ, our chief stone, the precious stone we find precious was disallowed. At one time, where he's disallowed by some even now. Disallowed means rejected. He was rejected. So although this stone was chosen by God, and although this stone is precious to us, it has been rejected by men. And we see this all throughout Christ's earthly ministry. He was rejected and he was despised. And the Apostle John writes in John chapter 1 verse 11, He, being Christ, came unto his own, and his own received him not. Speaking of the nation of Israel, Christ was rejected for his own, by his own people for many reasons. One is this. They rejected him because he was from the region of Galilee. He was from a land that wasn't desired. The Messiah wouldn't come from a district like that, they thought, because it's a worthless area. In John chapter 7, 52, that's what they say. They rejected him because he lacked the formal education. They wanted their Messiah to be brilliant and to be smart. Christ did not have the formal education, but he spoke with authority, and they despised him for it. John chapter 7, verse 15. Also, they rejected him because he rebuked the religious traditions of the Pharisees. That's what he did. He went amongst the Pharisees and he told them that they were vain and empty houses and that they didn't have the real substance of being saved and they despised him for it. And they rejected him because he sat at the table with sinners. He wanted people to come to know who he was. He wanted people to realize that in him was salvation and he was willing to share that with others and that took away the power from the Pharisees. They despised him for it. But although he was rejected by his own people, he was chosen by God. Jesus even refers to himself as the stone that was rejected by the builders. He even calls himself this stone throughout his ministry. And we see it in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. He says this, Jesus say unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So God had appointed that his stone, the Messiah that would come, would be rejected. He would be despised. He selected as God as the foundation for his church, though. And that's what we see in our text. Although he is rejected by some and disallowed by some, he is the very chief and corner being of this spiritual structure that we are gathering together with now. Not the building. I'm not speaking of the building. I'm talking about you and I, us. This is us. So notice with me at the very beginning of verse 4. Look there with me. I'll read it. It says, to whom coming. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this. Christ is a stone that we come to. He is the stone that we come to. We come to Christ, God's chosen and precious stones. Although he's rejected by some, he is the one that we go to. So first, we come to him for what? Salvation. 
We recognize in him salvation. He is the only one that can forgive us of our sins. In him is all righteousness. We recognize that. But also notice with me, the word is not past tense. Coming is not past tense. It's an active word. It's a word in which shows us that we are now in a dependency upon this stone. Those that have have trusted in him have not only trusted in him for salvation, they've trusted in him for dependency. This stone, if we're believers, is our source of rest. This stone is our source of comfort. This stone is our is a stone that we know that we can depend on and that we can provide or that will provide for us. We're constantly needing what he supplies, and we see it at the very beginning of verse 4. So although others rejected him, we have not rejected him. In fact, we see our need in him. We see that he's, he's what we want, he's what we need, and although the world has misunderstood who he is and what he's come to do, and they've rejected him because of sin, he is the one in which we go to. He is the one we continually go to. Look with me at verse 5. Here in verse 5, I want us to see how God is building his structure upon his chosen stone that we continue to go to, right? The one that was once rejected. But how he's doing it is interesting. He's adding lively stones on, on top. So if you're taking notes, verse 5, God is, all, is building his structure. He wants us to know he is building his structure using us. Look with me at the very beginning of verse 5. Notice it says, ye also. So as God's stone is a chosen and precious stone, singular, that's our Savior, Christ. We are chosen, precious, lively stones, plural. Notice that. God is building a spiritual house with a living stone, Jesus Christ, and adding lively stones to us. Now understand, God does not need to add us to his spiritual structure. But as we're going through this text, we're going to see why he's adding us to this spiritual structure. So what we should see here as we begin to go and worship the Lord, and as we understand this each and every week when we come to Him, we should come with a grateful heart, recognizing that God has chosen something precious that many in the world has rejected and has allowed us to build on top of the foundation. So when we come to worship and when we come to sing, we should have adoration in our hearts. We should have joy in our hearts. And remember, Peter, he's using imagery here from the physical temple in Jerusalem to describe us. The temple had stones, but guess what? Those temples were not living stones. They were not lively stones. That temple was not built upon the precious cornerstone. So that temple was a shadow of what we actually possess now and what we are built upon now. So it is greater than that. So Peter is helping us understand that what God is building with his spiritual house is better than the physical temple that Israel had had. There is more even than this, though. As we're built upon Christ and we are lively stones, when we come together, something very interesting happens. Something very interesting happens. This idea of building a spiritual habitation doesn't just take place in the book of Peter here. This idea also appears in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. But in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, the writer of the book, is giving us a few more details about this spiritual structure that Peter doesn't reveal to us. And it'll come up on the board here. It says this, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. And if you're writing notes, please let me encourage you to, to write this one down. This is very important. It says, in whom all the building, there you go, see that building, fitly framed together, unity, together, unity, groweth up a holy temple. So the holy temple in this text is the same as the spiritual habitation in our text. In the Lord, he says, in whom ye are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So ye, us, y'all, that's what ye means here, are builded together for a habitation of God. A habitation of God through the Spirit takes place. He's telling us that we're making a holy temple as a habitation of God. So how does that relate to us as we worship? Let's ask ourselves that question. This is unique. What takes place when we gather as believers here? A habitation of God is formed. That is amazing. That should change the way you see the gathering It should change the way in which you get up on Sunday morning. The gathering of believers is a habitation of God. That's not something to think is monotonous and mundane. Because that does not take place anywhere else except in the local churches. You can go to lunch after this and you're not going to have a spiritual habitation for God. 
But when you come amongst believers that are coming, understanding their need for salvation and singing praises and worshiping the Lord, it becomes a habitation of God. Just like the temple was temporarily in the Old Testament, is the same now. It's better than once was in the Old Testament. We are chosen to be this habitation, and we make this spiritual uh, temple. But remember, this building does not do that. It's us that gather inside the building that do that. The building is just a structure. It's just man-made. But what we have inside the structure is made by God. It's better. That should change the way you think about Sunday morning. That should change the way in which you gather in the morning. So let's get back to verse 5 and let's ask ourselves, why? Why is all this taking place? There's a reason that this is happening. Why is God choosing us to place upon the lively stone that has been rejected by many so that we can come in to his, together as believers and have a habitation. Why is this happening? You'll see it. We're going to have to kind of take the long route to get there, but we're going to see it. In order to answer that question of how we're being used, Peter's going to use language about the Old Testament priests. And we see it in verse 5. A holy priesthood, he says. A holy priesthood. And so under the Mosaic Covenant, God set up a system of laws to govern his relationship with his people. And the priesthood was given to Israel after they had left the nation of Egypt. And the priesthood was selected to be set apart. Understand that. We're talking about being set apart now. As the holy priests were set apart, we too are set apart. God set up the priesthood to teach Israel about his holiness. And so likewise, God would protect the nation of Israel from his holy presence by allowing the priests to offer sacrifices to atone for their sin. So as they would go into his presence, they would have to have their sins cleansed through sacrifices that the holy priesthood would offer up on their behalf so that they could collectively gather and so that the nation of Israel could come together. And so when Christ died on our cross, though, or on the cross, he played the part of the high priest. The high priest in the Old Testament was separated from the regular priesthood of the Levites. And he would go into the holy temple and he'd offer up a sacrifice once yearly so that the people would have a sacrifice. And so he was set apart. And so as we are a holy priesthood, we are operating under the chief priest or the high priest, which is our Lord Christ. And so as the the, the high priest in the Old Testament went to offer sacrifices. Our Lord Jesus Christ offered that once and final sacrifice to be done for the propitiation of sins. And so we are the priesthood, according to Peter, but not to offer up the, the sacrifices to atone for sins. But it's a different type of sacrifice. And you see it there, verse 5. It says, offer up spiritual sacrifices. So we as Levitical priests are offering up spiritual sacrifices in this spiritual habitation that we gather and we are singing praises unto the Lord in doing that. Bloody offerings are not necessary. Christ offered the bloody offering. The high priest offered that. That's not necessary. But offerings of the heart are necessary. And so that's where we're at this morning. When we gather, do we realize that we are built in this habitation for the Lord? He gathers with us to offer up spiritual sacrifices with the words that we come out of our mouth, with the condition of our hearts, with the way we greet fellow believers and brothers and sisters. This is all a spiritual offering as us as holy priests have been called to do. It's all typified and shadowed in the Old Testament. Our life is now a sacrifice for Jesus Christ. Not only just here, but our entire being is a sacrifice. The Apostle Paul touches on this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. No doubt many of you know this verse. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so from this, Offering spiritual sacrifices. I want us to see some truths in this that I I pray challenge the way you worship. And the first is this. Look with me. Verse 5, just to read it again. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. First, our spiritual sacrifices are only accepted by God because of Christ. Because he was the high priest. He was the one that offered the atoning sacrifice. The sacrifice that truly matters. So because of this, we have no reason to come in here and boast about anything that we do. This is not a place of boasting. This is a place of rejoicing and praying and praising. 
So when we sing, our voices, whether they don't sound good, whether you don't think they sound good or not, it's a spiritual sacrifice. It's a heart issue. It's not a voice issue, right? We're only accepted because of Christ. And so that, for that reason, any sacrifice that a believer offers is acceptable to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that should encourage you, whether you can sing or not. That should encourage you to know that your sacrifice, your spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God because he's accepted his son on your behalf. Secondly, there is no special class of people who mediate your access to God as a holy priest, right? You have access to God now as a priest, right now. You can offer a spiritual sacrifice at this very moment with a prayer in your mind, how you control your heart as you hear the preaching, what is going on in your mind as the preaching is taking place are all spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through His Son. So we can worship Him now even during the preaching, and the preaching actually is a worship. Lastly, I think this is important. We're not only passive stones in a building. We're lively stones. So the stones in the temple were just that, stones. They were just that. But we gather as lively stones. When we gather here, there is a participation. There is a participation. What we have here is unique. There are no observers if you're a believer. If you're a believer, there's no observing. If you're not a believer, unfortunately, there's only observing for you. Because you cannot offer up a spiritual sacrifice without first coming to the high priest, Jesus Christ. But that can change. So if you're taking notes, verses 6 through 8, you might write something like this. Our stone has been rejected by some and is precious to us. We're moving forward. Verses 6 through 8, second point. Our spiritual house is built on a precious stone. Peter's already introduced to us the stone is precious as being our Lord, Jesus Christ. But he is further trying to illustrate the uniqueness of Christ to us in verses 6 through 8. He's already illustrated he's the stone, but he wants us to further understand his uniqueness. And he opens up verse 6. He says, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. What he's doing, he's quoting an Old Testament passage. It's Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. But what he wants us to see here is that the chief cornerstone is stable. Right? This is not a stone that topples over and the building falls apart. Right? We collectively, when we come to the chief cornerstone, we are strengthened by the chief cornerstone. And he wants us to understand that. It's unique. It's not like any other physical structure. Notice also towards the end of verse 6, he says, And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So belief in the cornerstone is necessary to be added to the spiritual house. Belief is necessary. So if you're building without the chief cornerstone, you are confounded, he says in this passage. Confounded means put to shame. And that's kind of going back to the illustration that I had at the beginning of our text. I can build with my junk material. It's not going to contain this, the, the proper materials. Then it's not going to last. My, my posts that I, pu- I pulled out of the ground, if I try to reuse them again, it's not going to stand up straight because it's built upon fa- faulty material. So if you are trusting to build anything other than Christ in a spiritual habitation, you're confounded. You're building in vain. You don't have the proper material Because the chief cornerstone is necessary and belief in him is necessary to build upon. So we must come to him by faith. A.C. Price says this. He says, take away the cornerstones and the sides of the house would be separate from each other. The stones of which the walls are built may be of different sizes and of different degrees of value or beauty. Yet so long as they are held together by the cornerstone, the house is one house. Such is Christ, the precious cornerstone of the spiritual temple. So Christ, when we come together by faith, believing on him, we're no longer confounded, we're no longer shamed, but instead we're strengthened, is what we're seeing here. This is what he wants us to understand. The cornerstone is the strength of the building, just like the cornerstone is the strength of our faith. And we should see it that way. When we come to worship the Lord, he is the cornerstone of our faith. If you were, if it was upon you to keep your salvation, you would lose it. But because of the chief cornerstone, it is strengthened. It is held. You can come in this habitation with the assurance that Christ is holding your salvation because he is the chief cornerstone. You are not confounded. In older architecture, some of you may be familiar with this, in older architecture, they, the, the cornerstone would of, often be placed out 
on the corner where people could see it. They would, they would date the date that it was placed there and the people that, that built upon it. And they would, uh, uh, it would kind of be like the focal point of the architecture. All the other stones that were placed on top of it would kind of be in comparison to it, like to show the magnitude of it and show the size of it. And all the windows would be placed in the architecture in a way in which pointed the focal point to the eyes to the chief cornerstone. And so what Peter is kind of wanting us to understand about this chief cornerstone in verses 6 through, through 8 is like the beauty of that cornerstone in the old architecture, Christ is the beauty in our architecture. So as those, that chief cornerstone was placed and lively stones are placed on top of it, we are arrayed around him in a way that shows his beauty. And this is what he wants us to understand. We should see ourselves in that way. When we are placed upon the chief cornerstone, he's our strength. But when we're placed on top of the chief cornerstone, he is the beauty. We are displaying his preciousness. Verse 4, Peter says that he's precious. We are to display that preciousness. And if we're confounded, we can't show that preciousness. If we're confounded, we can't show that strength. This is what Peter wants us to see. But also, if our corner stone is removed from our structure what happens it falls so if the cornerstone is moved from an old architecture unless it's stabilized temporarily for a point in time it will fall and what happens to that architecture the beauty is diminished it's gone because the stones have fallen likewise for us if the cornerstone is taking out of what we do here then the beauty has fallen so if we're not careful this is exactly what we will be tempted to do We're tempted to do things our own way instead of the chief cornerstone's way. And when we do that, we lose the strength of the structure because we're built upon him. But when we do that, not only that, we lose the beauty of the structure because we're built upon him. So I hope you understand at this point that that Christ's this precious stone is something that's beautiful that we're all a part of, that we get to celebrate and rejoice in and sing praises to because this is a habitation of God and he is our structure. And if we do anything without him, it's in vain. It's to be confounded, as, as Peter says here. But also in verses 7 through 8, Peter wants us to see that although Christ is precious to believers, he's rejected by others. And we've kind of already touched on this, so I won't labor the point too much. In verse 7, Peter describes the nation of Israel that rejected him as disobedient. They are the ones who disallowed him. But notice why he was rejected. Why he was rejected at the end of verse 8. Look there with me. It says, those that were being disobedient, That means that those who were unpersuaded, disobedient means unpersuaded in this text, or those that have refused to believe. Those that have refused to believe who Christ is. So those that are rejecting Christ or refuse to believe who he is, then God has appointed them to stumble according to verse 8. Being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So God has appointed the people that have rejected him to stumble and to be into unbelief. And so, how does a person stop stumbling? How does a person get faith? How does a person uh, believe? Well, if we look back at verse 6, it's shown to us. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Faith is the thing that clears up your unbelief. (laughs) How amazing is that? You have to, I believe Pastor Chuck touched on this in his Sunday evening service last week. If you're confounded and you're stepping over the stone and you're stumbling over the Lord, then you have to come by faith. You have to stop believing and trusting in yourself. Just like the nation of Israel was disobedient to God, we have to be the same way. We we have to reject our disobedience. Just as they missed who he was, we can miss who he was too, who or who he is too. So this is really a call for those that have not trusted in Christ and those that who think they're too smart to receive Christ. We see that in this passage here in verses seven through eight. So as God has built a bridge for all men to come to receive him, that bridge is Jesus Christ. And he's allowed it through to both the Jew and the Gentile, us. And so, but we have to do this. Just as you can stumble on a bridge and fall into the water, if you're not careful, you can stumble on the bridge of Jesus Christ, but you won't fall in the water. You will instead fall into eternal hell. But how do you clear that up? You have to understand who Christ is. The unbeliever has to say, no, there's nothing good in myself. I believe that this precious stone or this stone here is indeed precious of God. And I reject my understanding. Lord, give me your understanding. And so in this passage, we see how does this affect our worship? Well, we see this. 
we can come into worship recognizing that God will give us understanding if we are unsaved and the unsaved person has an opportunity to repent at this very moment so he can be placed on the chief cornerstone to be a lively stone just like us. But he has to come God's way. He doesn't come his way. He doesn't keep his intellect. He doesn't keep his sinful nature. He doesn't keep his sinful desires, but he can come by faith. So although the unbeliever is not participating in worship with us now, the unbeliever can come inside our worship and see his need for salvation and reject his understanding and come to Christ and not be confounded by faith. And guess what? That was once us at one time. So how does that relate to worship? We have to come into God's spiritual habitation and praise him and thank him for bringing belief to us. And thinking that's a part of worship. When you come and you sing these songs, much of these hymns are about how you were a wretched sinner. That you're, you ought to be lifting your voice up to that. Because now you're not confounded. Now you're built upon the precious stone and you can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So verses six through eight, we can, we can call this a call for sinners to repent. Let's move forward. In verses nine through 10, Peter wants us to see that we are chosen to show the praises of God. We're chosen to show, to show the praises of God, verses 9 and 10. So we are a nation for a purpose. And see that at the beginning of verse 9. But ye are a chosen nation or a chosen generation. And so let's look at this passage to kind of see a little further what we're chosen for. And the first sub point I want to see in verses 9 to 10 is that we are a distinct people. So when we gather, we're distinct. We're not like everyone else. We can see that by looking at the similarities Peter makes with us in the Old Testament nation of Israel. He says we're a chosen generation. And chosen means to be picked out. So we are picked out. That should immediately show us that God's grace has been given to us. There is nothing about us that is special. God has chosen us, much in the same way God chose Israel. There was nothing unique or special about Israel. They were a small little nation. There was nothing that they could do or give uh, 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 to, to provide for God that he would make them want to choose him. And much in the same way with us, God shows us by grace just as he chose them. John chapter 15, verse 16 says this, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. They should go and bring forth fruit. Here in verse 9, the word generation, you see there, chosen generation means offspring from a particular people. We are the offspring, metaphorically speaking, of Israel. We are not Israel, but we are the offspring because of the promises that God has given them and been been fulfilled to us by faith. And so we're not from the same parents, metaphorically speaking, right? But instead, this word generation indicates that we're one or we're from one of the, of the same parents, our Father, the Lord. Our Father in heaven is what this indicates. So we're not exactly like them, but we're built upon the foundation that God has laid for them and is fulfilled in us so that we are this generation, this chosen generation. And he's using to build a spiritual house. Notice again the imagery to the Old Testament tabernacle. He calls us a royal priesthood again. As the nation of Israel had a function of priest, we too has a function. So think about that as we're touching on this idea of priesthood again. I want us to understand this is a function. We are a function. And so as royal priests, the Old Testament nation of Israel had a priesthood. But guess what? Today we don't have a priesthood. We are a priesthood. We are a priesthood. Although there were different functions, the Old Testament priest, uh, fun, excuse me. Although there were different functions, the Old Testament priesthood, they all worked under the authority of the high priest. So as we function, that's our authority. That's what we're to take from that. We should see every work we do as advancing His kingdom. That's what the priest is to do, advancing His kingdom. That's a part of worship. When you come here, you get rejuvenated. You ask the Lord, "How do you have? How would you want me to respond?" Our function is to take place here, but also to take place out there. Just as the Old Testament priest had a function, we too have a function. Next, I want us to see is that we have a calling. Our calling is a holy nation. So like the nation of Israel was called to be holy, we too are also called to be holy. We are different from the rest of the people, just as the tribe of Levi was different from the rest of Israel. Peter even says further in, or earlier in this book, he says, Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Next, we have a uniqueness. We're moving through this part of the passage pretty quick. Our uniqueness is that we are peculiar. Our uniqueness is that we are peculiar. The word peculiar is to denote that we are people for God's possession. We are possession. You have to see yourself that way. We belong to the Lord. We have been redeemed, which means bought back. 
So since we have been bought back from the consequences of sin and death, we are now a possession. We are peculiar to God. That word seems unique to us, and we use that in weird ways today, but that's, uh, we might be tempted to use that word in a different way now. But we belong to him. Titus 2.14 says the same. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So he has purified us. He's brought us back. He's made us peculiar. He's made us unique so that we would do good works. Part of your worship is to do good works. How you respond to the preaching and how you respond to the time that you've had in church is to be a good work out there. He's made you a priesthood so you could perform works out there. That's how you should see your worship. Next, our purpose is to show forth his praises. And this is the kind of the chief point here. And so because we have been chosen from the darkness and brought into the marvelous light of truth, our purpose is to praise God. This is what we do. Everything that we do, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31. Wherefore, whether, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all in the glory of God. And so the life of the Christian is constantly devoted to praise. And we see this in verse 9 through 10. We're showing forth the praises of God. We're a particular people that were chosen by God. But in times past, according to verse 10, we were not the people of God. But we've now obtained mercy. Recognizing that in our worship service is essential. And recognizing we're not saved and waiting for a trip to heaven on first class flight, right? No. God has chosen us. He's using us to build a habitation. And it's constantly building, being built, adding new believers on. But the chief cornerstone is the structure. The chief corner structure is the beauty. And we are here to serve him. And when we gather, this is a habitation for him, not for us. When we do things, we do things for him, not for us. When we, we perform service, we do things for him, not for us. When we sing songs, we sing for him, not for us. And all of this is because of the mercy that he's shown us. He's brought us out of the darkness and now we are into the light. And so we here at Edmond Road and other local churches that have believed the truth of the gospel, we are the greatest example of God's grace shown on earth. This is unique. We might not think it's unique because we, are, we think that gathering can be monotonous, but it isn't. We're a spiritual house and there are no observers in this priesthood. Everyone is active. Everyone is participating. Everyone is responding. Everyone recognizes the grace that has been shown to them. Everyone acts in a way that honors and pleases them and glorifies him. And when we leave this place, we look for a way in which to serve him out there. This is why we gather. So you can be rejuvenated throughout the week. So all the sin out there, you can come in here. Well, you should be doing it on your own time. But also in here, you can come in here and edify one another. You can be sharpened. You can be encouraged through the preaching and through the teaching and, and, and receive a message from the Lord and, and, and be challenged with the truth of it and be challenged to go out and, and set forth with action because we're spiritual house built upon the Lord. Warren Wiersbe uses this illustration, and we'll close here in a second. He says this, There was a contractor who was building a house. The first floor went fine, but as they began to build the second floor, the structure was not square. The wood wouldn't fit properly. The builders had to take a step back and analyze what they were doing. And they soon came to realize that they were building with two different blueprints. Obviously, one's right and the other's wrong. So they had a choice to make. Are they going to build with the right blueprints and reject the old blueprints and build it properly? Are they going to reject the proper blueprint, blueprints and use the old blueprints and have a faulty structure? And so my challenge is this. If we have learned that we were trying to build a spiritual house with the wrong blueprints, would you want to move, remove the old blueprints and do it as the Lord had seen it? Because this is what our challenge is in our text. If we were building up our own, mater- our own property or our own uh, uh, structure with our own faulty materials, using that illustration again, it's going to fall. We have to use the proper materials. Christ has to be the chief cornerstone. So when we come to worship, we have to recognize all these things. We have to recognize the grace he's shown us. We have to recognize and confess that we are sinners. We were once in the darkness. We've been brought to his marvelous grace. We have to recognize that he is precious. We have to glorify him and recognize that we are to respond to the things that his word says and go out into the community and do the things that he's called us to do because as priests, we are to serve him. And this is what the apostle Peter wants us to get to. And lastly, 
Maybe you're here this morning, you're stumbling still over the stone. You're rejecting Him. You, you're rejecting Christ. But l- let us see here that you're, you're, you've been rejecting Christ for, for years. You can't be convinced of who He is. Let me remind you, a bridge has been given to you. It's been extended to you. And just as easily as you can trip over the boards on the bridge and fall in the water, your spiritual life, if you trip over the bridge of Jesus Christ, you won't fall in the water. Let go of your intellect and trust who Christ says that he is. And you will not be confounded. 